for regulation. The Reins Act reins in out-of-control federal regulations that burden America's businesses and job creators. I thank Mr. Davis of Kentucky for introducing this legislation. I urge all my colleagues to support the Reins Act, and I'll reserve the balance of my time. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself two minutes. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the House, H.R. Uh, 10 is uh, the mother of all anti-regulatory bills. And since the uh, House was in session during 2010 for 116 legislative days, uh, under this bill, and I, I uh, invite any of my colleagues to uh, make uh, any different analysis, uh, the Congress would be required after 70 days after they receive a rule to act upon it. Uh, if you only have 116 days, legislative days a year, uh, it would be uh, literally impossible uh, to, to uh, handle the number of rules that we would get. Namely, we get uh, 94 rules last year, 116 days. If we were handling every rule, please use your uh, arithmetic skills, ladies and gentlemen. This bill would be Im unworkable and it would be impossible for new regulations to be enacted. But then maybe that's the whole thrust of the matter. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield six minutes to the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Davis, who is the sponsor of this legislation. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the chairman. Two years ago, I met with a constituent who was concerned about the effects of unfunded EPA mandates on his water and sewer bills. He wanted to know why Congress doesn't vote on new regulations. This simple question inspired the legislation that we're considering today, and it also begs a broader question. Who should be accountable to the American people for major laws with which they are forced to comply? Since the New Deal, every Congress has delegated more of its constitutional lawmaking authority to unelected bureaucrats and administrative agencies through vaguely written laws. This is an abdication of Congress's constitutional responsibility to write the laws. This practice of excessive delegation of legislative powers to the executive branch allows members of Congress to take credit for the benefits of a law it has passed and then blame federal agencies for the costs and requirements of regulations authorized by the same legislation. Members of Congress are never required to support, oppose, or otherwise contribute to federal regulations that are major and finalized under their watch. Even more troubling, this practice has enabled the executive branch to overstep the intent of Congress and legislate through regulation based on broad authorities previously given the agency. In recent years, we've seen examples of administrative agencies, regardless of party, going beyond their original grants of power to implement policies not approved by the People's Congress. In several cases, such as net neutrality rules and the regulation of carbon emissions, agencies are pursuing regulatory action after Congress has explicitly rejected the concept. In fact, administrative officials publicly proclaimed this strategy after the results of the 2010 elections, going around Congress by forcing their agenda through regulation. In February of last year, the New York Times quoted White House Communications Director Dan Pfeiffer as saying, in 2010, executive actions will also play a key role in advancing the administration's agenda. True to their word, the administration continues using regulations to, as an end around to Congress. The lack of congressional accountability for the regulatory process has allowed the regulatory state to grow almost unchecked for generations. Federal administrative agencies issued 3,271 new rules in 2010, or roughly nine regulations per day. These regulations have a profound impact on our economy. The Small Business Administration estimated that regulations cost the American economy $1.75 trillion in 2008, and that's nearly twice the amount of individual income taxes paid in this country that year. Small businesses spend an estimated $10,500 per employee to comply with federal rules, a considerable burden on the private sector's ability to create jobs at a time of continued economic struggles. 
Today we can choose to continue on this path or we can vote to restore our constitutional duty to make law and be held accountable for the details. The RAINS Act effectively constrains the delegation of congressional authority by limiting the size and scope of rulemaking permission. Once major rules are drafted and finalized by an agency, the RAINS Act would require Congress to hold an up or down vote on any major regulation. Major regulations are those with an annual economic impact of more than $100 million as determined by the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. The President would also have to sign the resolution before it could be enforced on the American people, job creators, or state and local governments. Every major regulation would be voted on within 70 legislative days. The RAINS Act was specifically written not to unnecessarily hold up the regulatory process. Rather, the bill prevents RAINS resolutions from being filibustered in the Senate. The point of the RAINS Act is simply accountability. Each congressman must take a stand and be accountable for regulations that cost our citizenry $100 million or more annually. No longer would Congress be able to avoid accountability by writing vague laws, requiring the benefits up front, and leaving the unpopular or costly elements to the bureaucrats who will write those elements of the law at some later date. Whether or not Congress approves a particular regulation, there will be clear there will be clearly a, an accountable vote on the subject that the American people can see and judge for themselves. This ensures the greatest regulatory burdens on our economy are necessary to promote the public welfare rather than simply sprouting from the minds of unelected bureaucrats. The bill's name is a metaphor for the reins on a horse's fitting. The purpose of reins is not to keep a horse at a standstill. Reins are a tool to ensure the horse knows what is expected of him and is acting according to the intent and will of the rider. Likewise, the RAINS Act would not stop the regulatory process. It would improve the regulatory process by ensuring that new major rules match the intent of Congress and the will of the American people. The RAINS Act would foster greater upfront cooperation between agencies and future Congresses, resulting in better written legislation and regulation. With greater accountability, transparency, Regulatory agencies will have no choice but to write regulations that reflect the need for sensible standards and take into account the impact regulations have on American businesses and families. Similarly, agencies would no longer be able to bypass Congress with regulations that don't match congressional intent or go too far. Not all regulations are bad. Many provide needed public safeguards, help to keep the American people safe, and maintain a level playing field for businesses to compete. And so good regulations would be approved by future Congresses, and those that could not withstand the public scrutiny of a vote in Congress would not. A common sense regulatory system with appropriate checks and balances on the most economically significant rules will help to revive our stagnant economy and give more businesses the ability to hire thanks to a better sense of stability and what to expect from Washington going forward. The question we're asked today is, in effect, the same I was asked by my constituent in August of 2009. Who should be accountable for the rules and regulations that have the greatest economic impact on our economy? My answer is the Congress. In an era of high unemployment, Congress can no longer avoid its responsibility to the American people for the regulatory burden. Passing the RAINS Act today would be a major step forward in returning to a constitutional, responsible legislative and regulatory framework. I want to thank Judiciary Chairman Lamar Smith for his countless efforts on behalf of the RAINS Act and his leadership, as well as the more than 200 co-sponsors of this bill in the House. I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Uh, I, I yield myself 15 seconds before yielding to uh, Mr. Moran. Uh, this is the RAINS Act is the mother of all anti-regulatory bills in the Congress. The, the only problem I say to the distinguished author, the gentleman from Kentucky, is that it won't work. There are only 116 legislative days. Uh, I, I turn now to uh, the gentleman that spent a lot of time on the floor monitoring this subject matter. I recognize Jim Moran of Virginia for two minutes. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. I thank the very distinguished chairman of the Judiciary Committee. This approach is neither effective nor responsible. To paraphrase H.L. Mencken, eliminating federal agency rulemaking as we know it is a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong. Mr. Speaker, despite what the House majority would like you to believe, our federal regulatory process is a model the world over. Delegations from other countries frequently visit our government agencies to learn how their governments can best ensure public involvement while maximizing government effectiveness and efficiency. Why? Because our regulatory system is the most open, 
and the most fair system in the world. Current law already guarantees that, that, excuse me, that proposed regulations get widely published and receive extensive public participation. The proof of that is that proposed regulations receive hundreds, thousands, even millions of public comments. The U.S. Forest Service, for example, received over 1.6 million comments on its roadless rule and held over 600 public meetings. And public involvement doesn't stop there. Federal agencies are required by law to consider and respond to each comment received. Commenters frequently request and receive comment period extensions. And when agencies learn of legitimate problems with their proposed regulations, they change or withdraw them to address those concerns. And as an additional check on federal agency rulemaking, Making Congress pass the Congressional Review Act. This law already provides a 60-day waiting period before a final rule becomes effective, and during that delay, Congress can disapprove an agency rule by joint resolution. The fact is that federal agencies already have the right attitude about regulation. I think Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke summed up agency regulatory philosophy best. We seek to implement the will of Congress in a manner that provides the greatest benefit at the lowest cost to society as a whole. This bill takes America in the wrong direction, one full of risks and costs that will put the public's health and safety at great risk. So I strongly urge my colleagues Gentlemen's to join Chairman Conyers in opposing this wrong legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield three minutes to my friend and colleague from Texas, Mr. Hensling, uh, who is also the chairman of the House Republican Conference. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Chairman, it was just a few weeks ago that our nation celebrated Thanksgiving. Unfortunately, in the Obama economy, millions could not give thanks for having a job. In the Obama economy, unemployment remains mired at near or above 9%. In the Obama economy, one in seven are on food stamps. In the Obama economy, we have seen the fewest, fewest small business startups in 17 years. And that's why, Mr. Chairman, jobs are job number one for House Republicans. That's why our jobs bills have been passed, but unfortunately, 25 of them are stacking up like cordwood in the Democratic-controlled Senate. After today, it will be 26, because one of the most important pro-jobs bill is on the floor today, the RAINS Act. Mr. Chairman, whether I'm speaking to Fortune 50 CEOs out of Dallas, Texas, where I reside, or small business people in East Texas that I have the privilege of representing in this body, they all tell me the same thing. The number one impediment to jobs in America today is the federal regulatory burden. I hear from them each and every day. I heard from the Grash family in the 5th District of Texas Quote, as a small business, I have to bring in an additional $1,000 a month to break even. He's talking about his regulatory burden. And this is while consumers have less money to purchase my services. I will not invest in any further expansion and therefore not hiring until smarter policies are being conveyed from Washington. Now, here from the Rossa family, also in the 5th District, who talks about the regulatory burden from the president's health care plan. Quote, my company has laid off all staff and I myself will fire, file for unemployment on Monday. That's about 23 people added to the unemployment rolls next week, again, due to federal regulation. I heard from the Nixon family in the 5th District of Texas. Federal regulation, again, we are giving up this part of our business. One person's losing their job. Quote, this is a small example of how excessive government re regulation is stifling business. It's the number one impediment, and all we're asking today with the RAINS Act is that if a regulation is going to cost our economy jobs, if it's going to cost $100 million or more, let's have congressional approval. It's common sense. It forces accountability. It simply weighs the benefits of a regulation to be balanced with the cost to our own jobs. Jobs ought to be number one in this House, and the number one jobs bill we can pass is the RAINS Act. I ask for once that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle join me, and let's put America back to work. It's expired. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to uh, recognize a ranking subcommittee chairman in the judiciary, Steve Cohen of Virginia, for three minutes. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for three minutes. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate Tennessee, the uh, Tennessee. I appreciate the time, but I don't appreciate the relocation. I am from Tennessee, the volunteer state, and from Memphis in particular. But it is appropriate, I guess, that we be a little confused with, with states because listening to the debate on the floor, it's obviously we're a little confused about history and presidents too. For President Obama has been bushwhacked here on the floor of the House. It's not the Obama economy, it's the Bush economy that President Obama saved from going into the second Great Depression that this country would have suffered in a hundred years. Saved it from depression with great actions at a time of bipartisan action that helped save this country from the Great Depression that it was otherwise looking at. And I think we need to commend President Bush and not bushwhack him when we get the chance here in the partisan discussions. This bill that's been brought up, H.R. 10, the RAINS Act, would rein in government. It would rein in the opportunity for regulations that are promulgated by our agencies with experts, with years of, of expertise and subject matters to come up, come up with rules and regulations to implement the laws that we pass. Now, I'm proud to be a member of the United States Congress, and I know that we have good men and women in this House, and most of the people are very good men and women. But right now, Congress has a 9 percent approval rating, and this bill would tell the American public that they should take the expertise of the people that are in the agencies and in the administration and turn it over to the 435 members, the 535 members, including Senate of Congress, the least approved government body that exists. Now, on one hand, they decry Congress. Their candidate, Mr. Perry, wants us to work half-time. But this bill would make us the super regulatory commission. We would have to approve every regulation by a positive vote in the House and a positive vote in the Senate and have to do it and have the president sign it within 70 days of promulgation. And we'd only have every other Thursday to do this. And we'd only have debate 30 minutes on each side. So you take the least respected body of government in the entire United States of America, maybe the entire world, and give it a very limited amount of time to make all the rules and regulations for the biggest government in the world. Talk about clean air, we wouldn't have it. You'd have more dirty rain. The RAINS Act, it should be called the Acid Rain Act. <laughs> this is not, we are raining, it is raining outside. It's raining prevarications and fabrications and canards upon us, none of which are appropriate for this body or for the American people. We've had several bills dealing with regulation this session, all of which basically tend to emasculate government take away the people's rights to clean air, clean water, safe products, occupational safety and health hazard protection, all of which are almost second nature to the American public. I'd ask us to defeat this bill and protect our environment and our workers. Thank you, and I yield back the remainder of my time. The back gentleman from Texas recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield two minutes to my friend and colleague from Texas, Mr. Poe, who is a member of the Judiciary Committee. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two minutes. The mere phrase, the regulators, brings fear and trepidation down in the hearts and souls of small business owners throughout the fruited plain. Mr. Chairman, the Code of Federal Regulations is 150,000 pages long. That's a lot of pages. That's a lot of regulations. According to Small Business Administration, the annual cost of all federal re regulations in this country is almost $2 trillion in 2008. And, Mr. Chairman, do we really need all of those expensive regulations? Good thing the uh, federal regulators weren't around when the Ten Commandments were written. No telling what additional regulations they would have added to those simple ten phrases. It is common sense that Congress should have a say on a regulation that would have a drastic, expensive effect on our economy. Now, why do my friends on the other side, who are such big fans of regulations, don't want the regulators to be regulated? I don't understand that. Congress is the branch of government, 
Remember, we are elected. The regulators are not. We're the branch of government that is closely connected to the people. And if Congress approves unnecessary and burdensome regulations, we have to be accountable to our voters in our districts for that. Who do the regulators answer to? No one. They only answer to their supervisors, who are also regulators. And when the regulators go to work every day, like most people go to work, their work assignment's a little different. In my opinion, they sit around a big oak table, table drinking their lattes. They have out their iPads and their computers, and they decide, who shall we regulate today? And they write a regulation and send it out to the masses and make us deal with the cost of that. All the RAINS Act does is ask that the Congress be involved in these overburdensome regulations. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield a distinguished gentleman from Florida, a valuable member of the Judiciary Committee, two minutes. The gentleman from, from Georgia, jo excuse me. The gentleman from Georgia and Hank Florida Johnson, recognized. Georgia. Well, I'm I like Florida, but I'm, uh, I hail from Georgia, and uh, sometimes I wish I was in Florida. And I tell you, uh, uh, I, I rise in opposition to H.R. 10, the so-called RAINS Act. It's a demonstration of the reign of terror that the uh, Tea Party, Grover Norquist Republican Party, has exacted on Americans insofar as their health and safety is concerned. In, in, in terms of their ability as a small business to compete with Wall Street and big business. You see, this is a uh, Christmas gift. It's a gift to those who installed this Tea Party reign in Congress. And this Tea Party reign, uh, the Republicans in Congress are doing everything that they're supposed to do. This is the anti-regulatory uh, bill that, as the chairman said, is the mother of all anti-regulatory bills. In fact, these 25, 26 bills that uh, uh, have been misnamed jobs bills that the Republicans have, have passed, nothing more than uh, anti-regulatory uh, uh, legislation sprinkled with a little anti-abortion. Uh, legislation in there, not one job uh, to be created, just simply uh, kowtowing to the wishes of, uh, of uh, those who uh, lined your pockets with gold in order for you to, to, to get elected. This anti-legislation, anti-regulatory legislation is uh, turning the clock back on progress in America. Uh, we want to turn it over all to big business. This is what the Wall Street uh, uh, occupation is all about. This is what the Tea Party is more all seconds. about. This bill will make it impossible to implement critical new regulations that place uh, some restraints on the uh, excesses of the uh, business community, and I ask that uh, it be defeated. And I yield back the balance of my time. Yield back. Gentleman from Texas Two minutes to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Quayle, who is a member of the Judiciary Committee. Minutes. I, I thank the gentleman for, for yielding. Um, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong support of H.R. 10 because greater congressional scrutiny of major regulations ensures that the federal government is more accountable to the American people. Now, poll after poll of small business owners, of medium-sized business owners, they will show you and tell you that major regulations are holding back their expansion and the ability for them to hire more workers. But you don't have to rely on polls. You can just go down and talk to the local businesses in your district. I had a job forum the other week. And time and time again, the constant refrain that we heard from these business leaders was that the overly burdensome regulatory environment is holding back their expansion. Now, several months ago, in the beginning of the 112th Congress, I had some hope. 
Because President Obama actually had his agencies provide an executive order that they required agencies to review the regulations to see if we can have a less burdensome regulatory environment. Unfortunately, what happened was that those were just words not followed up by actual action. Because since then, the administration has continued to introduce new regulations at a rapid rate. This year alone, over 73,000 pages of new regulations have been added to the Federal Register at a cost of $67.4 billion. Now, Mr. Speaker, right here, I have right here, this is the amount of paper that has been added to the Federal Register in one week. This is last week's regulations. It's pretty hefty. Actually, it's 8 pounds, 13 ounces. 2,940 brand new pages of federal regulations that would stretch, if you laid them in, 2,695 feet. Right now, there are more than 4,000 new regulations in the pipeline. Of those, 224 are major regulations that have an economic impact exceeding $100 million. So at a minimum, the annual economic impact for these new regulations will be $22 billion. Mr. Speaker, we need to change this. Some of these agencies act outside the statutory authority granted by Congress. We must stop this. The RAINS Act is the way to Gentleman's do it. Time's expired. And I strongly urge my colleagues to support this measure. Thank you. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized. I would yield now to a senior member of the House Judiciary Committee, the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, three minutes. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank the chairman. Thank the chairman as well. I think it's important for our colleagues to understand uh, just what is being uh, asked of this body. Uh, I believe it is a nullification of the Constitution, which I like to carry, and the very distinct uh, definition of the three branches of government and their responsibilities. Frankly, our friends are trying to equate uh, this Congress. Uh, and it's do-nothing record uh, to the work of the executive and now to create a do-nothing pathway uh, for the rulemaking process, which as I've indicated on many of the bills that have already passed, there is a federal court process for anyone that wants to challenge uh, the process of rulemaking or whether or not due process has been denied. So I'd actually say that what we have here uh, is a complete shutdown of the federal government. For it is asking this Congress to pass a joint resolution of approval for any major rule to be passed. Now, Mr. Chairman, let me suggest to you what would happen. Warnings on cigarette packages would no longer exist. Medicare payments for those lying in psychiatric hospitals would not be able to be paid and the emission standards for uh, boiler pollutants, hazardous pollutants, out of industrial, commercial, and uh, institutional emissions would go flat. And we would have a nation that small businesses, I believe, would argue would also be a distraction from the work that they do. It is interesting that my friends would want to use the backs of small businesses to pretend that they are protecting them. First of all, if they look at their facts, they'll know that the Obama administration has passed less rules than the Bush administration. As I indicated, they will also note that the 111th Congress passed more constructive bills to help small businesses than this Congress could ever do. And, in fact, they would note that it has been recorded that this Congress is the largest do-nothing Congress that has ever existed. It would be helpful if we could pass the payroll tax cut for 160 million Americans allow them to infuse dollars, a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, into the small businesses of America. I will tell you that my small businesses will celebrate that. In visiting a medical clinic owned by a doctor that had thousands of feet that he wanted to um, rehab and to expand, he said that payroll tax that was part of the jobs bill that the president wanted to pass through this do-nothing House of Representatives uh, would have helped him greatly. Then we have millions of Americans, six million, who are trying to get unemployment insurance. Here we are down to the last wire telling those in this blessed holiday season, whatever your faith, that you have to wait at the door. 
And in fact, there may not be any room at the end for six million who don't have their unemployment insurance. I don't want to shut down the government. I want a government that works. I thank the distinguished gentleman. I don't want to shut down the government. I want a government that works. Rulemaking is not the demon here. And the process of rulemaking, if you read it, provides the input and assessment of those who are concerned. What this does is involve the President, the Congress, in a scheme that is so dilatory that we will never do any work in this Congress. I General, beg of time's you expired. to defeat this legislation. I yield back. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Gentlemen, before yielding to the gentleman from Nevada, I yield myself 15 seconds. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to set the record straight. Now, the bill is not anti-regulatory, but pro-accountability. It will enable both Republican and Democratic majorities in Congress to make the final calls on major regulations that come from administrations of either party. Majorities of either party can be expected to approve regulations whenever appropriate. Gentlemen's time's expired. But the key is that Congress always be held accountable. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield two minutes to the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Amade, a member of the Judiciary Committee. The gentleman from Nevada is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also to uh, uh, my distinguished chairman from Texas. Eighty-five percent of the, of the land in Nevada is controlled by the federal government. Perhaps no other state in the nation lives with a more daily direct impact of the presence of the federal government and its regulatory regime than the Silver State. Community-driven development proposals that would generate economic growth often take years longer than they should because of layer upon layer of regulatory mandatory gymnastics. Home builders, agribusiness, mining, manufacturers, retailers, the resort and hospitality industries, small business in general, all lament the gymnastics that they have to go through to get a permit or even to comply with existing regulations. All of that effort in a state which I'm sorry to have to sit up here and remind you, 85 percent of the land controlled by the federal government, highest unemployment rate in the nation, highest foreclosure rate in the nation. We are trying to generate economic development and it is taking years to get a permit because of regulatory regimes. There is no one that will indicate that that is not the case. So when we talk about this issue before us today, and I, and I congratulate my colleague from Kentucky, when we talk about the job of Congress in an oversight sense, I think it is entirely appropriate that you revisit the regulations that are promulgated not out of thin air, but as a result of the statutes that pass these two houses. And to revisit that point and make sure that those regulations bear resemblance to both sides of the aisle's legislative intent where they're supported is something that we ought to guard zealously. Because the last time I checked, the federal elected officials in the executive branch numbered two. And it doesn't matter what side of the aisle they come from or what party they come from, I think it's appropriate for the 535 who send those measures to those folks, check back to make sure that's being done appropriately. I thank you for your consideration. Yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan Mr. is recognized. Speaker, I'm pleased now to recognize a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, Rob Andrews of New Jersey, two minutes. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, 25 days from now, if the Congress doesn't act, Every middle class family in this country is going to have a $1,000 tax increase. 25 days from now, if the Congress doesn't ask, doctors who take care of our Medicare patients are going to have a 23% cut in the fee they get to see Medicare patients. During those 25 days, several million Americans who are out there looking for a job every day are going to receive their last unemployment benefits check. These are the issues confronting America today, and what are we doing? We're debating a bill that says that some regulation the government might do someday in the future should have a procedure where Congress can reject it. There already is such a procedure. 
And for all these terrible regulations we keep hearing about that have been introduced this year, do you know how many times the majority has brought to the floor a resolution to reject one of those regulations? Once. So this is such a grave threat to the country's economy that the majority that controls the floor has chosen on one occasion to bring a regulation to the floor. What we ought to be doing is canceling out this $1,000 a year tax increase on the middle class. What we ought to be doing is making sure our seniors can see the doctor come January the 1st. What we ought to be doing is making sure that Americans who are diligently looking for work don't run out of unemployment benefits. But that's not what we're doing. This is not only the wrong bill, it's the wrong time. Let's put on the floor a bill that puts Americans back to work and focuses on the real priorities of the country. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, a senior member of the Judiciary Committee. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. The gentleman is recognized. With so many American families struggling, with so many Americans struggling to find work, and businesses struggling to hire, unemployed Americans, it's time to rein in the federal governments. It's time to rein in the avalanche of red tape cascading out of Washington, D.C. and stifling our recovery. It's time to enact the regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act of 2011, the RAINS Act. Uh, I want to rise to commend the gentleman from Kentucky, Congressman Jeff Davis for his visionary and tireless efforts in moving the RAINS Act to the floor today and for his leadership in this Congress. You know, small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy. They represent 99.7 percent of employer firms and have generated 65 percent of net new jobs over the past 17 years. Yet today, as most American small businesses know, our job creators are saddled with too many regulations and too many regulatory authorities. According to the Small Business Administration, the average small business faces uh, a cost of $10,585 in federal regulation per employee each and every year. The RAINS Act will address that. It will protect jobs and promote small business growth by ensuring that the legislative branch has the final say on major regulations before they take effect. This legislation reforms the rulemaking process by requiring that Congress approve any regulation that would have an annual economic impact of $100 million or more. For too long, Congress has delegated its legislative authority to unelected uh, bureaucrats and agency officials to determine the rulemaking process. It's time to bring that authority back into the Congress where the framers of the Constitution intended it to be, especially with regard to major rulemaking. The American people are hurting. The American economy is struggling. It's time to rein in big government and release the inherent power of the American economy again. I urge my colleagues to join with me in a bipartisan fashion, I hope and trust, in support of this important legislation. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan is Mr. recognized. Speaker, I am pleased to recognize from the Financial Services Committee uh, the Honorable Jim Himes of Connecticut, and yield to him two minutes. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, I rise this afternoon, as I frequently do in this chamber, a little incredulous at what it is that I'm hearing. I'm hearing stories about uh, East Texas. I'm hearing about lattes and laptops. I'm hearing that the number one reason American businesses are not hiring is because of regulations. It's baloney. There's not a fact in there. Here's some facts. I wish I had more time to get into these facts. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, which studies this stuff, asked businesses that have been laying people off why. Regulations was a negligible answer. I'd love to talk about Bruce Bartlett, financial advisor to President Reagan, Republican, who said that the notion that regulation is why this economy is on its back was just plain made up. If I had more time, I'd like to talk about our former colleague Sherwood Bollard of New York who said the House is moving forward with bills that would cripple the regulatory system, but they show how far a party enthralled to its rightmost wing is willing to veer from what has long been the mainstream. I've got deep problems 
with this crazy idea that we should have Congress sign off on every regulation. But my biggest problem, Mr. Chairman, is that we're standing here today talking about this. I hear endlessly about the uncertainty associated with these regulations. Mr. Chairman, I was shocked to look at my schedule tomorrow to see that the Republican majority is sending me home. And I'm going to talk to people in Connecticut tomorrow who are uncertain if after next month they're going to have unemployment insurance available to them because they don't have a job and they don't have money. And they may not have food on their table. Small businesses and an awful lot of Americans with jobs in my district are uncertain about whether they will see an extension of the payroll tax that we passed in bipartisan fashion. Except we're here talking about this. A fraudulent idea followed by a terrible po uh, legislative proposal. Instead of dealing with the imminent expiration of unemployment insurance and payroll tax, let's talk about those things. Let's remove the uncertainty for the people that we represent. We represent people. People have a lot of uncertainty about whether they'll have unemployment insurance or the payroll tax cut. Let's deal with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Paulson, who is a member of the Ways and Means Committee. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for one and a half minutes. Thank the gentleman for yielding. I want to rise as a co-sponsor and a strong supporter of the RAINS Act. This is legislation that will bring forward reform, accountability, and transparency to the federal rulemaking process. You know what? It's time for Congress to act more like a board of directors, where we will have to oversee proposed rules and regulations, especially those that have a significant economic impact. This bill will absolutely force accountability. It allows regulations to go forward, but it's also going to force Congress to analyze, to pay attention, and then finally to act. So no longer are we going to see agencies and unelected bureaucrats being able to promulgate these rules and regulations without having an appropriate check and a balance. Mr. Speaker, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these rules and regulations in the pipeline, and over 200, 224 specifically, that have that major economic impact threshold that would be affected by the RAINS Act. That's a cost of over $22 billion at a minimum to the economy. If we want to help small businesses grow, if we want to grow jobs, if we want to help our economy get going and jumpstart it, we need to remove that cloud of uncertainty that is hanging over the heads of small and medium-sized businesses in that regulatory environment. I want to thank my colleague from Kentucky for his leadership in leading this reform. I ask for its passage. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan. Mr. Is Speaker, I'm pleased now to recognize from Colorado the distinguished gentle lady who serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee, Diana DeGette. Two minutes. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from Colorado is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Do we really want to bind Congress to more votes so we can play Monday morning quarterback for the executive branch every time it tries to finalize a rule? Don't we have enough gridlock around here? Look around. The RAINS Act would grind our government to a halt and stymie the implementation of regulations to protect consumers and protect public health and well-being. Um, now look, this bill would add a feedback loop to require Congress to approve major rules that it's already specifically directed an agency to promulgate. What we really need are smart people and streamlined regulations regardless of which party is in charge of Congress. In 2010 alone, federal agencies finalized important rules relating to energy efficiency, community disaster loans, weatherization assistance for low-income people, truth in lending, and better pay for paid teachers. All of those rules would be considered major rules under the RAINS Act, and all of those rules would have uh, required congressional approval. Good luck there with this Congress. Who would oppose final approval of these rules that protect um, uh, everyday Americans? Well, based on the track record of the 112th Congress, some special interest group would find a way. In fact, the RAINS Act would allow special interests a backdoor entrance to have their way and weaken laws that protect the American people. Now, Mr. Chairman, we all know, standing here today, this bill won't become law. And the majority knows it, too. Why? Because it's a bad idea. 
in these last days of the year, what we should be doing is finding a way to help the millions of unemployed Americans who are looking for a job by extending their unemployment insurance. We should be helping middle class Americans by helping extend their payroll tax cuts so that they can pay for the food and everything else they're putting on their table. That's what the focus of this Congress should be, not passing ill-conceived legislation that will only slow down the process it's even expired. more. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gibson. The gentleman from New York is recognized for one and a half minutes. I thank the chairman. I rise today in strong support of the RAINS Act. This bill is about representative democracy, transparency, and accountability. The concept is simple. Any new proposed regulatory rule written by the federal bureaucracy that has an estimated economic impact greater than $100 million must first come here before the Congress for an up or down vote before implementation. To get our economy moving, to create jobs, to strengthen the jobs we have now and to raise the standard of living of all, we need to address the impediments to growth, taxes, regulation, health care costs and energy costs. Simple truth, federal regulations have increased the cost of doing business and contributed to job loss and stifled new job creation. Even the President has acknowledged this when he has appeared in this chamber to speak to the American people. According to the Small Business Administration, federal regulations cost our economy $1.75 trillion a year. This negative impact is something small business owners, including farmers, have told me time and again as I've traveled across the 137 towns in my district. Something must be done. It really comes down to judgment. We want to get these key decisions right. It's about, pal it's about balancing competing priorities. And in the process, certainly, we want to hear the advice of our subject matter experts in the bureaucracy. But the decision should fall to the people's representatives who can be held accountable for them, not unelected, faceless bureaucrats. It's far past time for some transparency and accountability. It's far past time for the RAINS Act. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of this bill and urge my colleagues to join me in voting for Gentlemen's it. And expired. I yield back. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Virginia a member of the Government Oversight Committee, Mr. Jerry Connolly, for two and one-half minutes. The I gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank my good friend from Michigan. Mr. Chairman, for the 173rd time this year, our friends on the other side have brought another anti-environmental, anti-public health bill to the floor. For good reason, this House majority has been identified as the most stridently anti-environmental Congress in history. In a tragic recantation of Republicans' heretofore historic commitment to conservation and public safety, the RAINS Act, like the Regulatory Accountability Act passed last week, has a poetic finality as it would block any and all progressive regulations, largely the legacy of Republican Teddy Roosevelt. Under Teddy Roosevelt's administration, in response to appalling food processing conditions, described in Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, Congress reacted and passed the first comprehensive food safety regulation. A hundred years later, the RAINS Act on the floor today would block even the most common sense regulations, which Congress mandated just last session. New standards to protect Americans from deadly contamination of Chinese and Mexican imported foods. The RAINS Act is a worthy piece of legislation for those among us who actually believe that Chinese factory farms should ship contaminated, uninspected food directly to American dinner tables. President T Teddy Roosevelt used the Antiquities Act, written by a Republican congressman, Congressman Lacey of Ohio, to protect the Grand Canyon, and thank God they did, when Congress at that time refused to designate it as a national park. The RAINS Act would prevent federal land management agencies from issuing regulations to protect America's greatest places from degradation, by mining and off-road vehicles. The RAINS Act also would block all regulations issued subsequent to the Roosevelt administration, I mean Teddy Roosevelt, including such landmarks bill as the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Wagner Labor Relations Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, along with the Regulatory Accountability Act, which the House approved last week. The RAINS Act is the most comprehensive, radical assault on American safety and public health in the last century. If RAINS passes, it will replace the rule of law with the rule of the jungle. 
And our friends on the other side know full well that in common sense language they have masked the inability of the federal government ever again to issue common sense regulation to protect public health, public health and safety in this country, and that would be a tragedy. Time's expired. I yield back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. I thank, the I thank the chairman. Over the past year, I've met with hundreds of businesses throughout the 8th District of Pennsylvania, and from each of them, I've heard a common theme. Uncertainty from constant new government regulation is impeding their ability and willingness to invest in our economy, expand their businesses, and to create jobs. In fact, just last night during a town hall, one of my constituents, Gallus Obert, lamented at the fact that new and burdensome regulations have driven small businesses and with them jobs from his Bristol Township in Bucks County. This should come as no surprise to any of us. Even President Obama admitted on January 18th that his administration's rules have placed unnecessary strain on businesses and stifled innovation and stifled job growth. Today, small businesses spend more than $10,000 per employee to comply with federal regulation. Compliance leads to higher consumer costs, lower wages, and reduced hiring. At the same time, the number of new rules and regulations continues to grow with each passing year. Just as our tax code is in need of reform, so is our ballooning regulatory system. The RAINS Act will provide the American people with both congressional oversight and congressional accountability for regulation stemming from legislation. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman Mr. from Michigan Speaker, is recognized. I'm pleased now to recognize the former chairman of the Education and Labor Committee, the Honorable George Miller of California. Three minutes. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. I want to thank the ranking member for yielding. The legislation before us today would really destroy the ability of the Congress to create new regulations, to create laws to protect the health and safety of the American citizens. It would also provide a great second bite at the apple for every special interest in this country that doesn't like the, the, the regulations to protect clean water and safe drinking water and the health and safety of our workers and our children at play. If you're wondering what it would look like when we wipe out the health and safety protections for Americans, you, look, you need to look no further than the Upper Big Branch Mine in West Virginia, where an explosion ripped through the mine and killed 29 miners in April of this, this year. That mine was operated as if there were no safety regulations. It was, they treated their workers as if there were no mine safety rules at all because they overruled all of those regulations through criminal activity, through illegal activity, and those miners were forced to work with essentially none of the value of health and safety regulations designed to protect their lives. And what happened in that mine without those regulations, without the benefit of those safety protections? An explosion ripped through that mine traveling 2,000 feet per second, and it consumed the lives of 29 miners. 29 workers died and their families will never be the same. That's what happens when you take away the basic worker protections intended to make our economy function and to keep our workers safe. And that's what this bill on the floor today would do. Now it's even more interesting that the man who broke the laws, created that system of no regulations for the miners in the upper big branch mine for his own personal benefit and the benefit of that of the corporation at the expense of his workers, may be getting back into the mining business. Donald Blankenship got $86 million golden parachute after 29 mine workers died in West Virginia, and now he wants to open a new mine. People who live in coal mining states like Kentucky should be aware that a serial violator of basic mine safety laws is coming to your state soon, seeking to operate a mine. Mine companies under his leadership have engaged in dangerous and deadly practices that would pose a threat to mine workers in your state. In the two years preceding the explosion of the Massey Company mines, they were cited over 10,000 times a year for violations. Under this provision, the coal miners come into Congress, they get the regulations to cease to, cease to exist, and they can go on their way, and there won't be 10,000 citations for the violation of occupational self and safety to protect those miners and other miners will lose their lives, like those in the Upper Big Branch Mine. I say to my colleagues in this House, you must defeat this incredibly offensive bill 
to every American. And you must do so in the name of these 29 mine workers that Gentlemen's were killed in the expired. upper Big Branch mine in West Virginia. They died Gentlemen's because of a expired. ruthless mine owner game the system. Let us not have a special interest game the Gentlemen's system in the Congress of the United States. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield two minutes to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong support of this bill, and I thank the gentleman from Texas, Chairman Smith, for yielding me this time, and I commend both him and the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. David, for Davis, for bringing this bill to the floor to us at this time. Thomas Donahue, President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, in his speech to the Jobs Summit a few months ago, said, quote, taken collectively, the the regulatory activity now underway is so over overwhelmingly beyond anything we have ever seen that we risk moving this country away from a government of the people to a government of regulators. I want to straighten out one thing, Mr. Speaker. This bill does not do away with any of the thousands and thousands of laws and rules and regulations that are already on the book. It applies only to new regulations which will cost businesses and the consumer over $100 million each. I think the American people would be very surprised if they thought the Congress did not already act on uh, legislation and laws that would cost our economy that much. We've heard estimates today that, uh, that by the SBA that uh, rules and regulations cost uh, small businesses almost $2 trillion a year and anywhere from eight to $10,000 per employee. We have so many thousands of regulations on the books uh, today, Mr. Speaker, that they haven't even designed a computer that can keep up with them, much less a human being. People are out there every day violating laws that they didn't even know were in existence. The thousands and thousands of rules and regulations that we have today make it more difficult to run and maintain a business than at any other time in this country's history. And they're the cause of why so many small businesses and medium-sized businesses are going under or being forced to merge and why the big keep getting bigger in almost every industry. The RAINS Act is a very modest attempt to end Washington's almost unchecked regulatory power. It would apply only to regulations which cost over $100 million annually, so there is nothing even close to being radical about this bill. I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting this bill this very moderate and reasonable Gentleman's bill, and expired. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. And Mr. Speaker, I am honored at this time to recognize the former Speaker of the House, the uh, leader, uh, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to oppose this bill, uh, so-called RAINS Act, and to urge my colleagues to act now uh, on behalf of jobs for America's workers. Uh, jobs are the lifeblood of our economic growth and that of the middle class, which is the backbone of our democracy. Mr. S uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the more than 330 days, the Republican majority has failed to put forward a clear jobs agenda, choosing instead to, cho to propose initiatives that undermine job creation and only benefit the special interest. Today, as we approach the end of this year, Republicans have again refused to vote to expand the payroll tax cut for the middle class and unemployment benefits for those who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. They risk the economic security really of all of us, certainly the 99%, but we are all in this together, as our president has said. Democrats have been clear. We must not go home for the holidays without extending the payroll tax cut and unemployment insurance benefits. We shouldn't be leaving hardworking Americans high and dry over this holiday season without doing their work. This challenge poses a question, why are we here? Republicans have chosen to be here for massive tax, tax cuts for people making over a million dollars a year. Not having a million dollars, making over a million dollars a year. 300,000 Americans. Democrats are here for the 160 million Americans facing tax cut uncertainty because of Republican inaction. 
But Democrats are here for everybody, for all Americans, because we all benefit from a strong middle class uh, with demand injected into our economy to create jobs. Indeed, if we fail to act now on the payroll tax cut and unemployment insurance, consider the consequences of that reduced demand to our economy. At least 600,000 jobs will be lost. Don't take it from me. Respected independent economies, economists have stated that. Over 6 million out-of-work Americans would lose assistance uh, in the beginning of next year. Now consider if we do act, and act we must, putting more than $1,500 in the pockets of the typical middle-class family, and every dollar invested in unemployment insurance yields a return of more than $1.50 in economic growth. What's important about that is what it does to inject demand into the economy. Money in the pockets of hard-working Americans, that's what we want this Congress to pass. Instead of being so completely wedded to the idea that if we give tax cuts to the top 1%, there will be a trickle-down effect. It hasn't happened. As we approach the end of this year, Congress has a responsibility to address America's top priority, jobs creation and economic growth. It's time for us to put the interest of working people ahead of the special interest. We must act now to reignite the American dream and build ladders of success for anyone willing to work hard and play by the rules, to remove obstacles of participation for those who wish to do that. We must spur our economy, put people to work, and strengthen our middle class. Now, we should not go home for the holidays without passing the middle income tax, the payroll tax cut, and unemployment insurance. And SGR, there are other issues uh, that need to be addressed that affect America's great middle class. Mr. Chairman, Christmas is coming, the goose is getting fat. Please to put a dollar in a worker's hand. I urge my colleagues to vote no on this RAINS Act and to get to work to extend the payroll tax cut and unemployment insurance for the American people. Only then will we increase demand in our economy, create jobs, promote economic growth, and put money into the pockets of 160 million Americans. Think of the difference that will make instead of putting forth legislation uh, that has no impact on our economic growth, is not in furtherance of job creation, is not in furtherance of, of strengthening the middle class, which is the backbone of our democracy. We can't go home without the payroll tax cut and unemployment benefits for all Americans who need them, who have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time.